Good evening, Saints. It's Evangelist Roxanne with Tacoma Christian Center. And tonight I want to talk about relationships, specifically our relationship with God. Because there's so many things in our life that are important to us, but even if our finances are going our way, if our health is good, if we're having success with you know, projects at work and, and we're having new opportunities, that can all be great. But if the relationships in our life are not solid or not strong or are frustrating for some reason, then that tends to really taint the way we feel about our life and the way we feel about ourselves. So tonight we want to make sure that at least we get one relationship right. And that is our relationship that we have with God, because truly our relationship with him is a match made in heaven. So let's talk a little bit about what it means to be this match made in heaven. When you think about it, God is the creator and sustainer of all things. And he created man to have fellowship with him. And each of us, he thinks about individually, specifically. He put us on this earth for a reason and had a design in his mind for us. So we were made for a unique relationship and fellowship with him. Each of us matter to him personally. It says he knows the count of the hairs on our head, and that might change daily, but he still knows what it is. And he enjoys our personality. He enjoys who he made us to be. And so how do we take advantage of that? And how do we build a strong relationship with a creator who knows us better than we even know ourselves? Well, first, I just want to point out that there is so much information and research and data around relationships and what makes a good relationship, what's required for a relationship to work. And you can find hundreds and thousands of different models out there talking about really how the individuals treat each other in order to build trust and support. How well do the individuals manage conflict and disappointment? How much shared responsibility is there for the money, for the household chores? It takes a while to work out how to be in a good balance, in a great give and take, when there's not somebody who's always taking, and there's always the ability then to give back in a unique way, in a way that matters to the other person. And for that relationship to last, the individuals have to keep adapting to each other, keep growing with each other, give up sometimes uh, things that you want in order for the benefit of the other person. That's just regularly the way we think about our human relationships. Right, but we, whatever the list, whatever the research that you do, you can come up with a number of different things. But I've just kind of summarized what's out there into three key areas. That for a relationship to be strong and last, the people have to share some very important values. You're not always gonna have the same opinion, but your values are gonna to need to be similar. Also, you have to care about the other person, genuine respect and love and an interest in their well-being. And that has to be mutual and go back and forth. But also to make and keep commitments to each other, to keep your word to each other. That's how you build trust where you can really rely on one another. So again, a lot of different information, but boiling it down to some very important key concepts of what makes human beings able to trust and rely and stay in relationship so with each other. So what is God looking for in a relationship? In a way, you can really look at the Bible and think about it as being his want ad, as he is really advertising for people to come to him, to join him, for us to enter into fellowship with him. And he has listed some very important things in scripture. One is he's just looking for people who are of faith, who will be faithful unto him. He's also looking for a repentant heart. And that repentant heart is turning away from others and turning to him and being faithful and loyal to him. And he's also looking for people who are really committed and who value the things that he values. 
right? He needs us to be his hands and his heart and his, his uh, spirit here on this earth. And so he's leaning into us and he's calling out and crying out. And throughout the Bible, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, he's barely really clear that this is the type of person he is drawing into his kingdom. And this is the type of relationship that he wants us to be able to have with him. So let's dive into each one of these. The first is just noticing how often God talks to us about being people of faith. He talks about believing, being fully convinced that having a faith walk is one of the most important things. It's very hard to be in relationship with God. We can't be in a relationship with God unless we believe that he exists and we're ready to have faith in his word and the things that he tells us. Belief and trust and faith, they are listed, you can see, hundreds of times across the scriptures in order to really encourage people and recognize you've got to believe in me, you've got to have faith in me. And out of that belief and out of that faith should come a trust. Because if you believe the word, if you have faith in me and I deliver to unto you the things that I have promised in my word, the trust is going to grow. And that really is the center of a good, strong relationship with God. Just calling out a few of the scriptures that let us know that. In Hebrews eleven six, 6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. This is the foundation of our relationship with him. If we don't believe not only that he exists, but if we don't believe that he's good and he's rewarding our relationship with him, then we're not going to have much of a foundation. We're not going to have a lot of trust. We're not going to have a lot of closeness and confidence in this relationship. And God made this relationship to be close and strong. And so our faith walk and our faith talk and our getting to know him, our desire to seek out and learn as much and be as close to him as possible is a huge part of us being able to establish the type of relationship that he wants with us and that we most benefit from. See, we have to really ask ourselves, what do we believe about God? We've entered into this relationship with him, or if you're considering whether you should, you really want to know the person that you are talking about having a relationship with. And for me, that means knowing God, the Father, but also knowing the Son personally and knowing the Holy Spirit that resides in me. Do I believe that all of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit loves me and that I was created by God and have a purpose, that God wants the best for me and that his timing is perfect? I believe that God is good and that God doesn't lie. Anything that he's told me I can hold in confidence and believe my God is just and my God is able. See, however I view God, I'm going to bring that into the relationship. And I've got to have faith and belief and confidence in his goodness and to really understand him. Probably the most frustrating thing we have in our human relationships when people don't really get us. You know, when the relationship's been wounded because one has been unfaithful or has treated us unkind. But when we go into this relationship with God, God is saying, I'm always going to come ready to be what you need in this relationship. But he's not just molded to us as some idea. He is real. He has a mind. He has a will. He has emotion. He's got desires for us. He's got his own interest. He's got his will, and his will is for our good. So the more I know who he is because of his word, and I have faith in him as being everything the word has told me he is, the stronger our relationship can be. We have to start with that foundation and just keep getting to know him deeper and deeper and more and more 
personally, not just the idea of him, but take that faith and take that knowledge for yourself. Because sometimes people are fine with that relationship and belief that somebody else has in God. But where is your relationship with God? What is the faith factor that you have then in your relationship with God? Yes, I believe that he exists, but what all do you believe about him? What do you believe he's capable of doing? What do you believe he wants for you in your life? You know, a couple more scriptures is just saying we have to hold fast to the profession of our faith. Do we ever waver in believing that he loves us? Do we ever waver in believing that he has a plan for us? He is faithful to what he promised. So if you ever feel like you're slipping away in that relationship with God, that's time to open up the word and ask yourself, do I believe what I read? And is that going to be my profession? Is that what I'm going to hold in my heart? Is that what I'm going to have be the thoughts going through my mind and the words coming out my mouth? Is that I know who God is and how great he is and how good he is. And I know he's going to come through. He wants to be in relationship with people who believe in him. Believe that he's good. Believe that he can and believe that he will. And when we come to the relationship with the faith, he meets us there. And we then have the joy of having a good, strong relationship with God. We know the scripture in Hebrews that defines what faith is, but the whole set of scriptures, how they work together are so powerful. It says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Note that the faith is what gave the elders, the believers in Christ, a good report. With who? A good report with God. Our faith as elders, and even if we're new to the faith, just the fact that we have it is what's going to give us a good report. It's what matters to God in the relationship. And it's through our faith that we understand that the worlds were framed just by the word of God. He spoke it and things that weren't there appeared. And that is our faith in our relationship with God. The more we talk with him, the more we know he talks, the more we realize that's all he needs to do is to say the word. And we believe regardless of what has to be moved or changed and going on around us, that if God could create everything just with his words, he can certainly intervene just with words. He can reach us just with words. And the word that God gives us is enough. It sustains us. It proves to us that he is real, that we're in relationship with him, that he is listening, and that he is more than able to respond. Well, beyond faith, we know that a repentant heart matters to God. It says he will not despise a broken or repentant heart in Psalms. He doesn't despise it. He doesn't turn it away. But that's an important part for us to realize what repentance actually means. We know that there's a lot of negativity that will pull us in. Doubt will pull us in. Sin can pull us in. But God says, I understand that. And I'm not going to be mad at you because you stumble and because you have a negative thought. But what I do need in this relationship is that you're able to turn away from that negative thought and turn to me. And that repentance is a sorrow. This says, I'm sorry I turned in the wrong direction and I am ready to turn back in the right direction. It's not turning towards sin and stumbling and then staying there. It's getting back up and turning back to God. It's the saying, I'm sorry. Just like being able to say, I'm sorry in a relationship heals it and matters so much between mankind, between our friends, between our family. And God again talks how powerful the heart is, that he knows our heart and the heart and the heart being repentance is really the thing he is looking for in his relationship with us. He forgives us so easily. 
He needs us to forgive others. He needs us to forgive him if we are holding it against him that he didn't do something that we wanted him to do, something we believe we needed him to do, that he didn't do it in the timeline that we wanted to have happen. He said, in this world, there are going to be struggles. We have loved ones that we lose and we grieve. But do we forgive him for not making life the way we want it to be? Knowing that this world and this life is temporary. And there is a time and a place where we will be able to be with him. And things will go more our way. But in every relationship, it's not all about one person getting their way and the other person accommodating them all of the time. God's saying, I know that you're going to stumble. I understand the world that you live in. I understand that having a relationship with me, God, can be very hard. I just need you to have a broken and a repentant heart. And that brokenness is just a humility for our selfishness to be broken so that we can really surrender our own will to what is better, to what we can have between the two of us, God and us together, and not just our own interests being met. So a repentant heart, what is so powerful about it is that it really hates to wound the relationship, realizing that when we make mistakes, it's not just about the consequences to us, It wounds the relationship we have with God. If we let sin, which is an offense to God, sit there, it's going to wound our relationship with him. We're not going to feel close to him. We're going to feel guilty. We're going to let conviction and condemnation come in between us. And it's just like not speaking to someone you love because you don't know how to deal with it. If we're not speaking to God, we're going to let a wound fester. And so we've got to be able to address those things that are harming the relationship. And just a few of the scriptures that talk about this, that God needs us to be able to turn back to him and make things right when we've gone in the wrong direction. Says in Corinthians, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret but worldly sorrow brings death. We don't want any regrets or anything between us and God. And it's okay for us to have to repent and turn from sin back to God. He said that's going to lead to longer life. It's not the type of sorrow that depresses us and holds us down. He's very happy. And if we truly are repentant before God, we release a burden that just brings us peace and joy and gives us that fresh start and renewal to the relationship. Acts says, repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. As soon as you have them, repent. Don't be ashamed. Don't hold on to them. Don't turn away from God. Just Give it up to God and let it go. And he'll help you change over those thoughts. Timothy encourages us to instruct opponents. Instruct those who really don't know any better about what they have done to harm you and what you need in return. And it says, God, as you instruct people for doing the wrong things, God's going to grant repentance. And when there's repentance, then it leads to the truth. And the truth is what is able to get us back into a right relationship. No more fears, no more lies, no more doubts. If there's harm being done to each other out of anger, explaining what really happened and explaining what you need. God expects us to have that type of relationship with him where we can work with him through any conflict or doubt or frustration or fear. And he will teach us to let those things go. He'll give us the truth that we can grab onto that's going to give us that peace and restore us to a right relationship with him. And Luke says, there's going to be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. God loves a repentant heart. He loves the humility 
when we recognize we've fallen short. And he's so glad that we're able to keep coming back to him. Being vulnerable before God is such an important part of a true relationship with him. You know, 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, and that's the part on us, confessing our sins, stopping and thinking about just even the little times where we put off when he was putting something on our heart, when we didn't stop and take time to, to thank him, like the lepers who ran off, when he was trying to get us to do something on his behalf and, and we said no, when we kept doing something he was trying to get us to stop doing, when he wanted us to reach out and love and we pulled back. God says, just confess it. In his part to the relationship, if he's gonna be faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's not holding on to it and keeping it between us to ruin the relationship. So we need to confess the, the sins, get rid of them. So they're not between us and God and compromising the relationship. So the heart factor, something for each of us to ask ourselves: what is that heart factor going on between us and God right now? You know, God says, blessed are the pure in heart for they're gonna see him. And that's just not on the other side in heaven, but to really see and feel and be close to God. When we are pure in heart, when we get rid of the sin and the angst and, and the pain, and we work it out with him quickly, and we get a pureness in our heart, we're going to feel and see and know God more personally and deeply. And we will we'll feel that closeness. And that closeness is what draws us all into God. And that's what makes every relationship great, when it can be intimate and pure. Scripture says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Cleansing our heart, making it right, getting rid of anything that can make us feel separated from God's love. He's always there in relationship with us, but sometimes the relationship doesn't feel close if we haven't washed our heart and we've let things get into our heart that force a separation between God. And remember, we are a match made in heaven. He made us each specifically to have a relationship with us. Next, the works and the reward. You know, we have been saved by grace. That is not of ourselves. But beyond salvation, which we don't work for, God really has an expectation that we are working with him. That is one of the great parts of our relationship is that we are walking in agreement and we are doing great things together. And our works and what we do with our hands matters greatly to God. And God talks about rewarding that. And part of that reward is just the fellowship and the relationship that we have here with him here on earth. The other part of the reward is what it stores up for us in heaven. And what matters to him is that we use this body that he has given us, the spirit that he's put inside of us, and the relationship that we have with him and with Jesus, our Lord, that we use all of that to make great things happen here on this earth. And James lets us know, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. For him, it's not enough just to be in relationship and believe in him. He wants us out of that belief to know him so well and what matters to him that we have to share that with the world and we have to go do great things with him because of the strength of our relationship. So throughout scripture, and this definitely is just a handful, if you pull up those reward scriptures, if you pull up the work scriptures, throughout even especially the New Testament, after we know we are saved by grace, there still is a desire in God's heart for us to be working with him. In Colossians, it says, whatever you do, work heartily. As for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving 
the Lord Christ, just as we would do for our children, just as we do for our spouse, just as we would do something as a favor to our friends and want to take care of them and do things that make their life better. God is looking for that in our relationship with him. He gives that to us, things that make us feel better. He provides for us. He does for us all the time. Our part in the relationship is to the to do the same for our friend. Do what we're able to do for him. It says, God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. Jeremiah, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Hebrews 25, 21, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little and I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So we know this goes back to parables about faithful servants and, and use of talents. God, because he loved us and created us, he gave us these marvelous gifts. And just like we love to see our child learn to ride a bike or bake or do well on a test. God loves to see us use everything he has given us for our time here on this earth and for our eternal time with him. That brings him joy. Hebrews 13, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. In Romans 2, 6, he will render to each one according to his works. Salvation get, gets our name in the Lamb's book of life. Everything above and beyond that, God said, is in our hands. And he's here in relationship with us for those works to be done, for us to explore truly how marvelous he created us to be and what all we can accomplish with him. It's nice being in relationship with God because even if you feel like you are out there alone, you're sent out onto the water to do something that maybe scares you to do it, you're not doing it alone. You're doing it in relationship with him. You have the partnership of God for every work that you take on to do for his kingdom. Specifically, we think about not just here on this earth, but God promises to reward the work that we do on his behalf. And there are crowns listed in scripture. We always think about going into heaven and getting a jewel in our crowns, but specifically, God calls out certain types of crowns for doing certain things. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it now, but be sure to write these down and go back and see what it takes, according to God, in order to do this work and achieve this crown. Now, some of this is obvious. You know, a soul winner's crown is spreading the word, bringing other people into relationship with God. But the overcomer's crown and the martyr's crown are both the crown of life. Those who lose their life for the cause of Christ are going to gain it in heaven. And those who do not turn away from God here on this earth, who overcome whatever challenge, who say, I'm going to keep this relationship with God no matter what. I'm not going to turn away from him. I'm going to keep getting deeper and deeper in relationship with him, which means I'm going to keep doing more and more with and for him. That's what earns you, the overcomer's crown listed in James 1.12. But the scripture is about running the race, completing your course, doing those things that God called you to do, even if it's a fight and fighting that good fight of faith and racing to the very end, that is what gives you these crowns. And those of us who are mature in the Lord, the elders who manage the church, who manage the flock with the pastor, that's how you get the elders crown. Again, God is not shy about saying, this is what matters to me. And not just to know me, 
but to use the knowledge and love that I have for you to do things on my behalf, that is a relationship that God is looking for, right? So the work factor in your relationship with God, what does that look like for you? Now, in Revelations, when, when God is judging the churches, he looks across, and first, I'll mention, he says to the church at Ephesus, you are doing wonderful things, but the one thing I have against you is you've forgotten your first love. You've forgotten that relationship with me is the most important thing. Don't get busy doing things and forgetting about the relationship, and don't try to do things without being in relationship with me, because that will just be work and that will wear you down. But doing my work with me is the best relationship. It's going out as a family and in a partnership in order to volunteer and to do great works. That's where we get closer to God in doing the work and not further away. And he says, I'm gonna come quickly, so hold fast to those things that you already have and which you know and understand. Don't let anybody take your crown. Don't make anybody take you away from the possibility of earning any of these crowns. Stay steadfast. And in James, it says, a man may say, thou have faith and I have works, but show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Which leads into verse 20 that we read before, because faith without works is dead. And we don't want our relationship with God to die because we're not ready to engage and work with him to do what he created us to do. You know, so God and you, individually, personally, you are a match made in heaven. You're a match made to last. And all relationships can go through highs and lows and dry spells. And if you're starting to feel like you're in a dry spell with God, know that your relationship with him matters to him greatly. And that you have the chance to spark and revitalize your relationship with God by building your faith, by having a repentant heart, and by choosing to work with him to do works that last, those things that put a smile on his face, those things that he has committed to reward us for doing. For our God truly is good, and he loves each one of us individually, and he made us because he wants to have fellowship and relationship. And if we get this fellowship and relationship right, how powerful that is, because no matter what's going on in the world around us, if we have a relationship with God that cannot be moved, nothing else will be able to move us. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we love you and we thank you that we have this fellowship and this relationship with you that can be so deep and so personal, Father God, and you created us for it. And you do your part. You are always here. You are always near. You always are ready to move and come closer to us, Father God, when we let you in. So today we want to let you in. We want to increase the faith that we have. We want to turn our heart to you and we want to turn over our hands to join you in fellowship in a relationship that goes deeper and further than we could ever imagine. We thank you that we are not alone and that you chose us and you are available to each one of us every single day, Father. Remind us when we wake up in the morning that you are right there and let us go throughout the day enjoying every moment with you and talking with you and fellowshipping with you and looking for our opportunities to serve you well. 
we thank you for this gift of this relationship with you, Father God. You envisioned it before you even set our name and made us present here on this earth, Father God. You imagined a great relationship with us all along, and we just are excited to accept it and to grow it, Father, so that we can experience even more of you in the days and the weeks to come. And we thank you for this. We praise you for this and glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen.